if you are new this morning, haven't been with us through this series, I just want to let you know, we are going through the Gospel of John, and we are in John chapter 8. So if you've got your Bibles, iPads, iPhones, Androids, whatever you got, if you want to turn there, John chapter 8, that's where we're going to be this morning, where you can follow along. Um, normally, we, I try to go through an entire chapter each week, which is a lot, a lot of times, especially, you know, different chapters or different links. And so um, I told you early on, there will be weeks where I choose to maybe focus on um, just a certain section of that chapter, summarize the rest of it as we go. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to be doing this morning. And so I, I, hopefully you'll, you'll understand in a minute. But we, as I was preparing for this, I originally intended to do the whole entire chapter. And then it was just like God was saying, no, how about you don't do what you want to do. How about you do what I want you to do? And you just do this one story, and I want you to just preach and teach that story. And so I try to be as obedient as I can, and so that's what we're going to do this morning, which means next week we will summarize the rest of chapter 8, hit chapter 9. Hopefully we will be totally caught up. My goal is that um, we are going to be to the point where we land on Palm Sunday in John chapter 12, and so it all kind of lines up. We're all prepared, we're ready, and on Palm Sunday we're there with that scripture in in John 12, which is only like four weeks from now, which is totally crazy to me that this year is going by so, so fast. But really excited today because in this chapter 8, we get to sit at the feet of Jesus and he deals with a very delicate and a very difficult situation. And it's kind of, it's very tense. And how he deals with it, what he does, I just feel like, wow, we are going to be so blessed by this. Um, and I think we'll learn a lot from it this morning as well. I do want to address that in probably most of your translations, uh, when it goes from chapter 7 to chapter 8, there is a little comment there, a little comment section maybe, or a little footnote that says something to the effect of the earliest manuscripts do not have John seven fifty three through eight eleven, And that's there because the earliest manuscripts don't have it. How's that for depth, right? How's that? You're, right? You're kind of like, geez, thanks, that really helps. Honestly, uh, the... the I won't get real deep into this because that's not really what we're here to study this morning. It's basically there, there is a, a debate between antiquity and quantity. Um, and so when you go back and you look at this, the oldest manuscripts don't have it. Many of the ancient uh, manuscripts do. And so since we don't have any of the original manuscripts, uh, we use the ancient manuscripts, to, uh, the copies of that, uh, to put together and put in order the books of the Bible. That's the way they did it. And so some translations like to point out the fact, like those little facts for us. Other translations are like, no, it's, that's unimportant. We know it belongs there, and they don't even mention it. I personally believe it belongs here in chapter 8, should be included. It is consistent with everything else that we read in John's gospel. And not only that, more importantly, of course, all of Scripture uh, as well. So that does, does not diminish anything at all this morning uh, that your Bibles may say that in between. Remember from last week, Jesus is in Jerusalem, right? He's there for the Feast of Tabernacles, and he has been teaching in the temple and, and preaching and trying to explain uh, to those who are listening that he is the Messiah. Uh, he's like, this is who I am. He's revealing himself, and he is calling himself God, and he is, you know, he's letting them know who he is, where he's come from. And, and so he's obviously, because of that, he's been met with a lot of animosity um, a lot of people don't like him at all, especially the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Um, and we saw at the end of chapter 7, even, I mean, they, they're ready. They want to arrest him. They want to kill him. They want to be done with him. And this morning in, in our text, we're going to see that, you know, he, he left that. He goes, retreats to the Mount of Olives, which he often did this. He would retreat to the Mount of Olives. And then he returns back to the temple courts again. And he is preaching and teaching again. Now, this was very customary for rabbis. This is what they did. They were in Jerusalem. They would go to the temple courts. They would preach. They would teach. People would, crowds would come around them, um, and they would listen, and they would learn. That's what the setting is kind of today. He's there. He's preaching. He's teaching. But something happens that was way out of the norm. Matter of fact, on this particular day, it's very tragic. Um, what happens uh, to, in front of Jesus and in front of these people. And uh, we're going to read it today, and then we're going to see how does Jesus deal with this. Because he is put on the spot. He is, has to respond in the midst of everybody, in front of everyone, to something that was very, very difficult. So let's read it, 
and we're going to, John 8, we're going to start in chat, or verse 2, read through 11, and then we're going to spend some time this morning kind of pulling this apart, seeing how we can apply it to our lives as well. It says, at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, <clears throat> and he sat down to teach them. That's what really good teachers do. They sit down when they teach. I'm just playing. Just playing. <laughs> Verse 3. <clears throat> the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman stand, still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Now, I love this story. I love what this story communicates to me. It's one of the best stories in scripture that we have on the topic of grace. But as we will see today... Um, it would be easy, and many, unfortunately, many pastors and churches do this. It would be very easy to take this story and twist the story in favor of Jesus being soft on sin. But that's not what's going on here. Jesus is not being soft on sin here at all. He's being extravagant with grace. Big difference, and we're going to see that this morning. And I don't know about you, but I am thankful for the extravagant grace of God in my life. How about you? Amen? Amen. Amen. And so... We're going to see in this story, we have a woman caught, notice it says, in the act of adultery. Now, we need to understand that this, this wasn't like they heard about it, and they're like, oh yeah, remember we heard about that lady that did that, who, who had, you know, was in an adulterous affair or whatever, let's go get her and let's take him before Jesus. That's, that's not what went down here. This describes more of a door being flung open a woman being drug out of the bed, probably not even appropriately clothed, paraded through the streets of the temple, brought before Jesus and all of the people that are there to stand in front of them and be humiliated. Now, I want us to pause and think about this for just a moment because I think it'd be easy for us to skip past that and kind of get to the other parts of the story. <clears throat> but I want us to think for just a moment and make sure we're, we, we get what's going on here. You need, we need to understand this. We need to ask the question of how did they know that she was in the middle of this act? Um, we're told, right, the answer in verse 6 for sure that this is all staged. This was a trap. This had nothing to do with this woman. It had everything to do with them trying to trap Jesus. They knew Jesus was going to be teaching that day. They knew then, okay, let's orchestrate this plan in order to try and trap him. And yeah, we'll do this at this woman's expense. It's a horrible, despicable thing that they've done <clears throat> to this woman. Now, ladies, I want you to help me out here. What's missing from the picture? <laughs> okay, hey, easy, okay. <laughs> wow, it's kind of like mm, the man, right? <laughs> uh-huh, pastor, go ahead, preach on that. Where's the man in this thing? Why is he, I get it, I get it. Easy. Y'all, some of y'all are in trouble. Don't even think about it, right? Anyway. Here, here, here let's, we're going to talk about this, though, because it does say very clearly that she's caught in the act of adultery, right? Last time I checked, it takes two to tango. We know that for sure. So don't think for a minute that since this was the, oh, it's a male-dominated uh, culture, somehow they just didn't care about the guy. No, this was 100% a setup. More than likely, they would have hired this guy to set up this moment for them. Now, I'm not saying that this... Please understand, I'm not saying this makes her innocent. I'm not saying, well, it wasn't this woman's fault. She's just as guilty. She was a part of this. But I just want to make sure we understand how deceitful the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were. Because 
the very Mosaic law that they're quoting to Jesus here in, in verse 5, it required that the man be stoned as well. Okay? And I'll even read this to you just in case you think I'm making it up. Deuteronomy, it's in a couple different places. Deuteronomy 22, 22 says this. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. Adultery was a capital offense. Aren't we glad we live under grace today? Right? I mean, many of us, we've, some of you, you've had to deal with this in your own life. And so in this day, in this time, both were guilty. And this is the way they dealt with it. And so we can see the law required that the man should have been brought before Jesus as well. The fact that he's not here, it's just more evidence this is a total setup with no regard to this woman at all. They didn't even care about the woman or obviously the man in this whole point. That wasn't the point of what they were trying to accomplish. And this is so uncomfortable of a scene to even think about. I think that's probably why we try to, we read it and kind of move on. But I don't want to do that. I, I want us to go there. I want you to imagine this being you. In the middle, and, and I, I don't think this is healthy for us to do all the time, but I think it's healthy for us to do sometimes, which is I want you in your own mind to go back to your deepest, darkest moment of sin. When you know you're embarrassed of it, maybe nobody in the world even knows about it besides you and God. Maybe a lot of people know about it, and you try to forget about it. And I'm not saying we should go and be bringing up our old sin and, and in any way, shape, or form. But I think it's good for us at times to remember who we are and what we're capable of. And I want you to think about that moment, that deepest, darkest sin that you've ever committed in your life. And I want you to picture someone then busting open the door, or depending on where this happened or what, it was, what was going on, they drag you away, and they bring you to the church in the middle of a service, something like this, in front of all of these people, and they stand you before everyone, and they tell everyone what you were just caught doing. Imagine the humiliation. Imagine the shame. This would have been mortifying for this woman, which again, it just shows how low these Pharisees, these, these teachers of the law had sunk to try and trap Jesus. They are willing to destroy, humiliate, and shame this woman just to try to discredit Jesus. And this is honestly, absolutely pure evil. They say, verse 5, when the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women, now what do you say? Now obviously, Jesus knows what's going on. We even are privy to what's going on because we obviously can read the Bible. We know, many of us, if you've not read the story, you maybe don't know, but most of us know how this ends, what's going on, what's happening here. So we have an advantage. But from their point of view in this moment, they think they've got Jesus trapped. There's no way he's getting out of this one. This was, this was our best plan we've ever come up with. I mean, what's he going to do? He, we've got him in the middle of all these people here. And how is he going to get out of this one? They, they feel good about what they've set up. Because they know if Jesus says, let her go, you're, you're breaking the, the law of Moses. Because the law was very clear, they should, she should be stoned for what she's done. And then they also know if he says, okay, kill her, that that's going to, he's supposed to be this friend of sinners. He's supposed to be this man of mercy. And this would, wouldn't line up so much with what he's been preaching and teaching. And so it would just send everybody into an uproar and, and it would mess up what Jesus is trying to accomplish. It would definitely turn people against him. It, they were trying to accuse him. That This is what it was all about. It was a huge trap. So what's Jesus do? What's he going to do? Well, verse 6 says, they were using this question as a trap in order to, uh, to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So Jesus doesn't do anything at first. He doesn't just respond out of anger. He, he doesn't just shoot from the cuff, though he could have done that. Instead, he chooses to take this moment and do nothing but stoop down and write something in the dirt. Now, we don't know what he wrote. There have been tons of speculations through the years, and scholars speculate what he was writing down. We don't know. The truth is, we don't know what he wrote. But what we can do is we can imagine the tension that's building here. People wondering, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? Oh, my goodness. How's he going to get out of this one? And, and I believe Jesus wanted that tension to build. I think he, 
again, it says they continued to question him. Maybe he was just waiting for them to stop talking, but they just kept going and kept going. They were questioning him over and over. Some people speculate that what Jesus was writing was the Ten Commandments, that he was literally writing the Ten Commandments out to prepare them for what he knew he was about to say. Could be. Some think he may have been even writing their own sin, their own personal sin, that he knew, that maybe only he knew about them. Maybe a little initial next to it, right? And uh, the people standing there kind of going, oh, shoot. Like that, that, you know, that's not good. That's not good that I think I know exactly who he's talking to here. We don't know. We don't know what, what was being written. All we know is that he took his time. He wrote something in the dirt. Then he stands back up and he makes one of the most brilliant statements that have ever been made. And he says, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then it says in verse 8, after he says that, it says, again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. He continues to write. Jesus throws out this truth bomb and then he decides, I'm going to let that simmer for a little bit with you guys. And he just continues to write. Again, we don't know what he's writing. Whatever it is, whatever is happening here, I, what I think is interesting to me is that there's only two places in all of Scripture that talk about the finger of God writing something. One of them is right here. The other is in Exodus 31, 18, when it says, When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Was he writing the Ten Commandments? Was he writing out their own sins? We don't know. But while he was writing, and because of what he said, and maybe because of what he was writing, they fall under conviction. All of them fall under conviction. It says in verse 9, At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now, I want you to notice the older ones are the ones who left first. And probably, maybe you thought about this. I wonder what that reasoning was for that. Why do you suppose that was? Well, I think it's because they were wiser. I think they picked up on it real quick, like, oh, yeah, this isn't good. Like, I, that, you know, the longer you live, and you'll, you'll figure this out. Those of you who are still pretty young, you don't realize how bad of a sinner you are just yet. You'll get there. When you get older, the older you get, you'll figure it out. And the longer you live, the more sin you rack up in your life. And hopefully, it therefore makes you more understanding and forgiving toward others and their sin. And I just want to pause here for a minute, <clears throat> because to me, this is a very important point. This is something that every single one of us who are going to call ourselves Christ followers, we've got to understand this. I want you to hear me on this. If you're one of those people that likes to take notes and write things down, I would even encourage you to write a version of this down. And that's this. Until we truly understand and admit that we are all sinners saved only by the grace of God, we will walk around with stones in our hands thinking we somehow have the right to pick apart someone else's sin. Until we truly understand and admit that we are all sinners, saved only by the grace of God, we will see other people's sin as worse than our sin, more disgusting and more evil, and therefore think we somehow have the right to gossip about them or hate them or be unloving toward them and ultimately think we are somehow better than them. And while Jesus would, all the while, Jesus would say, no, your sin is no more or less disgusting than anyone else's sin. And if you somehow think for a minute that I didn't have to go to the cross for you, that you didn't need my blood, that you don't need forgiveness, that you don't need God's grace, then by all means you have every right to cast your stones at those you feel deserve it. Church, until we see sin properly, until we understand how evil we all truly are, the gospel will never resonate in our souls like it should. Grace will never be something we truly grasp or something we will be capable of giving away because you can't give away something that you don't have and something that you don't understand. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus calls these people who brought this woman before him. Verse 10 it says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Now, I actually kind of like um, 
the New King James version of this, how it translated here, it says this way, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Do you know who the Bible describes as the accuser? Listen to Romans 12.10. It says, The accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. It's talking about Satan. Satan is known as the accuser. Even after we have been forgiven. Have you ever had those moments in your life, those thoughts at some point in your life of you just feel like, I don't know if I'm really forgiven or not. I don't know, am I really forgiven for that? Did, did, is God really okay with me? You know, is, is, do I need to do something else? Am I really forgiven? When you have those kind of moments, I want you to know that is not from God. That is from Satan. He is whispering those lies to you, accusing you, because this is what he does. This is who he is. He constantly accuses us before God. That's what Scripture tells us. The other word Jesus uses here is the word condemned. Romans 8, 1 through 3 says, Therefore there is no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was, was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. What are you trying to say, Pastor? What I'm trying to say is this. I'm saying accusers and condemners, those are the spirit of Satan. This crowd, these accusers were operating in the spirit of Satan, not in the spirit of God, and I want to be very clear here. Hear me on this. I am not saying nor suggesting that we ignore sin. That, that's not it at all. And, and all those, some will take this passage and treat it like Jesus is soft on sin, like I said. And so therefore, since Jesus is, seems to be soft on sin here, so we should be too. That's just not true. Look at how this story ends. Verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now, if he stopped there, I get it. If that's where this story stops, I get it. I understand why people would take this and they could accuse Jesus here of being soft on sin. It's almost like he would be saying, they don't accuse you? Okay, neither do I. Don't worry about it. A lot of people commit adultery. Go on your way. God is love. You know, we, we could, they, would, they would do that. They do that with this passage already. And, but they forget this last part. Because this isn't how the conversation ends with with Jesus and this woman. Instead, Jesus says, go now and leave your life of sin. And that's the balance here. This is the balance. Sin is a big deal. We are never ever in Scripture, and again, I'll tell you this, I've told you this for 20-some years now, you can't read Scripture and read one verse or two verses or a few verses and then make all your judgment off of that. We have to read it in the context of the entire Bible and we know from all of Scripture, we are never told to ignore sin. We're never told what we, or discard it or, or not take it seriously, but instead we're taught to fight against it, to leave it behind, to run from it, to confess it, to repent of it. Jesus is saying here, stop it. Quit doing it. Don't do this ever again. No, it's not, he's not saying it's not a big deal. You can't help it. You were born this way. And what were you supposed to do? That's not what he is saying here at all. No, God hates sin and we should hate it as well. And we should fight against it every single day of our lives. But I want you to hear me on this. The motivation to do so should come from a place of love. It should come from a place of respect and gratitude for our Lord and Savior who had to die on a cross in order for you to be forgiven of your sin. So like I said earlier, what... Whenever it truly hits you, how evil of a person you really are, when you finally see just how great your sin is to God, it's then that you will finally understand how great God's grace truly is. And that's where the motivation will come from to do your best every day to live a life that is pleasing to Him. Jesus isn't being soft on sin here. He calls her to leave it. Sin is a big deal, but grace is an even bigger deal. And we got to see it that way. we got to understand it that way. This is why Paul wrote, this is why it's so beautiful when you read Romans 5.20, right, where it says, 
But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. In other words, you can't out God's grace. Amen? Some, somebody needs to hear that. I think we all need to hear that today. But someone, I feel like there's just this kind of message, these kind of moments. Satan is so good at making us feel so worthless. And like, how could you do that? And why are you even sitting in church? You don't belong there. I mean, all these other people love Jesus. Are you sure you should be there? I want you to know, whoever you're sitting next to, every single one of these people in here is filled with sin, just like you are. And they are saved only by the grace of God, just like you are. No one's better than anybody else here, myself included. And we've got to understand we're on the same playing field here. This is, this is not some kind of a, this, is a, this is, should be a house for the broken and those that are trying to be restored and coming to worship the Lord. This is not meant to be a museum for good people. That's not what this is about. This is a hospital. It's a triage unit. We come here and we're like, listen, I need to be restored. I need to, I need to spend time with the Lord. I need to know more about him. I need to spend time worshiping him. Why wouldn't I want to do this when I realize what he's done for me? We've got to put ourselves in the proper place here. You can't out God's grace. This woman's humiliation was condemnation enough. And Jesus obviously knew her heart. He knew that she was sorrowful for her sin. He didn't need, she didn't need more condemnation. What she needed was exactly what he gave her, which was grace. Jesus did, by the way, the exact opposite of what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law here did. They disgraced her. Jesus graced her. This story should compel every single one of us to think long and hard about which camp do we tend to be in. On a daily basis, not on your best moment. Maybe I'll even give you the not even in your worst moment. But where do you tend to be most of the time? Whether it's with yourself, right? With ourselves and how we think of our own sin, beating ourselves up about our own sin, or against someone who we don't like, or against someone who has hurt us in some way. We need to constantly be asking ourselves this question. Am I a gracious grace giver? Am I a gracious grace giver? Would somebody describe me as that? Could I describe myself as that? Is that my go-to? Or do I tend to be more of the accuser, condemner type, which we've already talked about where that comes from? Am I known to make my little comments about people and then try to justify it by saying, well, I just call it like I see it? No, it should be, well, I'm just going to be more like Satan right now and be an accuser and be a condemner because that's, that's what I want to do and I don't care what anybody else thinks. You should care. And you should be thanking God every day that he doesn't treat you that way. If this is you, I'm telling you, you don't truly understand or at least appreciate the grace of God that's been offered to you. Because the truth is, church, if we really understood and knew the grace of God, we would be the most gracious people on the face of the earth. Because we would understand that we all stand before the cross in the exact same condition, sinners that deserve eternal damnation. But thanks be to God, as Paul says, for his indescribable gift. Thanks be to God that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Church, when we finally come to grips with our own sin and the gracious love and forgiveness of our God, not only will we walk in grace, but we will extend it to other people as well. I want to close with a story of a man who understood grace more than most. And because he did, he has probably blessed your life more than you know. His name is John Newton, and he grew up with quite a difficult life. His father was away at sea during his early years upbringing. He was raised by his mother, Elizabeth. When John was 11 years old, his mother passed away, and he was sent to be raised by his father aboard the ship. And many of you, have, I'm sure you've heard stories of sailors and the lives that they lived and the mouth that they had and the things they do. It's kind of where we get some of the sayings that we get, cusses like a sailor, or those types of things, because that life is a rough life. And that lifestyle took a toll on him and his moral principles. And over the years, John's lifestyle became a very, very, very sinful one. It be, he became captain of a slave trading ship. 
In his own words of his diary, he describes how cruel and sinful of a man he was, especially the way he treated the slaves. He was known as both a rapist and a murderer of the slaves. He was a part of some of the most heinous sins that you could imagine. But eventually, John would happen upon a copy of a devotional called The Imitation of Christ, which cut him straight to the heart. And that book, along with a shipwreck and a few other things, it began to, it turned him for Jesus. He would eventually dedicate his life to following the Lord, becoming a pastor at 39 years old, fighting against eventually the slave trade, what he used to support, be a part of, condone, make money from. He died in December of 1807, and this is what it reads on his gravestone. It says, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith that he had long labored to destroy. John Newton understood grace because he understood the gravity of his sin, of how undeserving of grace he was. He got that. It resonated with him. He realized what he had been saved from, <clears throat> what he didn't deserve. And it's why when he penned probably the most famous song in all of the world, he wrote in that first stanza, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That was his testimony. That wasn't just a, some words he wrote down that he thought sounded good. This was him expressing his, his love for the Lord. God, your, your grace is truly amazing. I don't deserve it. I'm a wretched man. The things I've done, I, I can't even believe that I've done, but I did those things, and it's only by your grace and mercy that I'm forgiven. He got that, and he wrote that down, and God has used that song. I know it's probably every single person in this room has been affected positively by it in some form or fashion. This was his testimony. He understood, much like this woman in our story this morning, what grace feels like. He understood that without Jesus, he was going to hell. This woman walked away understanding that without Jesus, she would have lost her life that day. And the same goes for you and me. Without Jesus, there is no grace, there is no mercy, there is no forgiveness of sin. But with Jesus, we, it's that place, right, that we have faith and we can trust him. And when we place that faith and that trust solely in him, grace abounds freely. Forgiveness is received and heaven is promised. Aren't you thankful for the saving grace of Jesus this morning? Amen? And if you are, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to be sure that, to extend it to other people as well. It's, it, it does us no good to, to sit here and, and in our pious ways like we tend to do many times in the church through the years, not just First Christian Church, the church. We've not always done a good job of this. We love accepting it for ourselves. We love the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus for ourselves. But we don't do the best job sometimes of extending that to other people. And I think that's because we just don't get it sometimes. Jesus told many other stories that he tried to get us to understand that. Listen, go, you, you be this way towards other people. Let's go and be like Jesus, church. Let's be those people who not ignore sin. I'm not saying, we, we talked about this last week, there are times to call sin out. There's ways to call sin out with, with just a graciousness and a love and a gentleness and a respect. There's also, we are to be people of grace and a people of mercy. And the only way we're ever going to get there and treat people properly, especially the ones who have hurt us, especially the ones that sin in some way that we just for some reason think is more disgusting than our own sin, the only way we're going to offer grace to those people is if we will remember, constantly remember what we have been forgiven for. Constantly remember how much grace has been offered to us who don't deserve it. I pray this is something we are going to strive for, that we will continually ask ourselves that question that I posed to you earlier. Am I a gracious grace giver? 
If not, it's something we should all be working on. Let's pray.